At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us pray. Almighty ever living God, constantly accomplish the Paschal mystery within us, that those you are pleased to make new and holy baptism may under your protective care bear much fruit and come to the joys of life eternal. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. This evening we are going to be continuing our meditation and reflection upon passages of sacred scripture that relate in different ways to the new evangelization which Pope Benedict has signaled for us at following the example of uh, Pope John Paul as a theme we need to think about, how to let the light of Christ burn brightly in this world where sometimes in some places within our own hearts it's begun to flicker a bit and needs uh, new life and a new connection with our Lord. And so we've looked at different passages. We've prayed over different sections from the the New Testament, uh, particularly reflecting on the proclamation of the joyful boldness of the the Word of God. The passage this evening is uh, the beautiful section from the letter to the Colossians, which speaks to us of something very important if we are going to be agents of the new evangelization. And that is that it's enough, uh, not enough just simply to speak of the Lord outwardly. We have to ourselves be living lives in Christ. As we hear in this passage, we need to be living in connection with the one who is above, not drawn down by the things of this world, the things that can take us aside and clog up our ability to be in touch with the Lord and all the light of Christ within us so that we cannot share it with others. And so we need to be attentive to that. And the passage uh, this evening is one which presents us with two ways. As the famous uh, book, The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles says, there are two ways, the way to life and the way to death, and there is a great difference between them. And so we're called always to make a choice. 
Shall we follow the way of the Lord or turn aside the way that leads upward or the, the way that is of this earth? And those two options are placed before us very clearly in uh, the passage this evening. This passage is a very beautiful one to use as an examination of conscience. And uh, very often when I've been giving uh, retreats or been doing things like that, I often suggest that one of the readings we might use uh, from sacred scripture is this passage from Colossians, because it shows us the negative way, we don't go there, but it also shows us the positive way. This is the way we are to be. And you know, it's vice and virtue, um, hell and heaven, Babylon the Great, the New Jerusalem. And um, as Bishop Sheen often would, uh, would point out, we're meant mainly to be thinking of the pathway to virtue, fill our lives with virtue, not simply avoiding evil or avoiding vice. Let it not be said, the Archbishop of Toronto says, do not avoid vice, I, I agree, <laughs> avoid vice, go away from that. that. That's true, but we're not to be simply negative and turning away from what we shouldn't do. We need to be above all reflecting on what we should. And this passage is so beautiful because it, it gives us the, a positive path after very honestly showing us the negative one. And then it, it ends off with song and thanksgiving. Sing songs and sacred hymns to God. And fairly often uh, over the years as I've been often speaking and leading retreats on the praying of the divine office, of the Psalms of the office, I always start off with this passage because it says sing psalms to the Lord. Uh, this is what we're called to do. This is what we've just done as we prayed the Psalms of the Old Testament and that beautiful one for the book of Revelation that ends off the evening prayer, you know, hallelujah, da 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 Oh, it's so beautiful, especially in this Easter time. And so we are people called to sing psalms to the Lord and to praise him with our hearts. And by the way, also do not live that other way that we hear about in the first part of this passage. And if we can do that, live it that way, then we will be ourselves instruments of the new evangelization. We can reach out then to others and to help them come to know our Lord Jesus and to let their lives be transformed as if we ourselves have been transformed this way. So now let us enter into this experience of prayer as we encounter our blessed Lord through the words of sacred scripture. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us now ask our Lord to free us from all those distractions all those busy, busy things that so occupy our minds, those worries that can so consume us, always worrying what will happen, what will be, all those things that can take us away from the ability to live in the present moment and hear his word. Help us, O Lord, to be free of those cares and worries and distractions that so consume us. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. We ask the Lord to free us as well from those sins that block the light of Christ, that are a barrier to, so that uh, the pathway to our hearts is, is blocked. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death therefore what is earthly in you fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you once walked when you lived in them. But now, put them all away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. 
do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature and its practices, and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness and patience, forbearing one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We're servants of our risen Lord. We are to to live anew. We have been raised in Christ. So we need to focus our lives on the Lord. We think of St. Stephen, the first martyr who could, as he was dying and proclaiming the faith, he could see the glory of the Lord before him. We keep our eyes on that which is above, which guides us through the storms of this world. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Seek them passionately, constantly. We direct our way towards the Lord. He is the star we steer by. You know, if we know where we're going, we're likely to get there. That's what we need to do have our eyes on the Lord, and let the other things then follow from that. Seek to be, seek the things that are above, that which is of Christ, where he is seated at the right hand of God. And that gives us consolation and strength and hope in this world, because a lot within our own hearts is of this earth, and the world we're living in is very much like that as well, things that are not above which are, draw us down, consume us. And so we need to rise above that by God's grace and recognize that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, the power and the majesty of the Lord. So often in medieval churches, you would see the image of Christ the ruler in judgment to give a sense of the goal of everything. We need to be conscious of that and be aware that the strife is o'er, the battle won, now is the victory begun. And so we should not be worn down when we're facing the various cares that overcome us, whether it is in the world outside or within our own struggles, in our own hearts with the things which pull us down. Christ is risen, alleluia, and that should be in our hearts. And so let us uh, reflect on that and ask that we may in our own hearts be constantly focused on the one who is above, on the Lord. Keep our eyes on him as he guides us through the storm, as he guides us through the difficulties of the pathway we face in the long journey, which is our mission and our time of service as disciples here on earth. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you.
Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. And here we begin now to make that division. The things that are above, the things that are on earth. We got to know the difference between them and choose that which is above, not the things of the earth. Our life is constantly a matter of choice. It is the sheep and the goats, as the Lord tells us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It is the Beatitudes and the woes. It goes right back through the ancient tradition of the church and right back to the Old Testament. The things above and the things below. And we're always making decisions. Sometimes they may be dramatic decisions, great conversions like that of St. Augustine and others, dramatic and magnificent. But every day is woven out of choices. Choices to seek the things above or the things below. Always we ask God's grace to choose the Lord and not even in little things, the things that lead us always away. So we're always making these decisions. It's like the, you know, the fundamental reality of the most complex computer program it comes down to little zeros and ones, this way or that. Our life is woven of small choices, things above or things below. And so day by day, we need to just uh, say always, constantly, back again and again, Lord, help me to choose you. And everything I say, everything I do, and later on we will hear the more specific details of that. But before we get to that, the Lord speaks to us here, be ready to make choices all the time. And it's, matter, it's not just the freedom of the choice that we make, it is to respond to God's grace and always choose the ones that are above. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. For you have died. Away with all that. That's the, the great symbolism of the full sign of baptism. The going down under the water and rising up again. New life. The white robes that the people put on when they're baptized. You have died. The rest is, is gone. Away with all of that. The things that are below. You have put on the white robes of gladness. You are baptized. That's what the Lord says. You have died to all of that. And your life is hid with Christ in God. We have begun anew. It is our risen Lord. And it is not just now. We also think of the coming of the Lord. The resurrection and we think of the coming of our Lord. And that is something that should be an encouraging thought. If it isn't, we better get the confession. There we are. But we need to think of the coming of the Lord. This is the joy. We wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Lord. We hope. We, we should. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And that's our great hope, that we will be brought there to the Lord in the glory of the Lord. The coming of the Lord at the end of time, whatever that is, the end of the world, who knows? It's not for us to speculate. The only date we have for that is we do not know the day or the hour. So we don't worry about that kind of distraction. But we wait for the coming of the Lord, which is most profoundly at the moment we see him face to face at the moment of our death. And of course, the coming of the Lord most immediately to prepare us for both the end of the world and our own death is the Holy Eucharist. It is there that the Lord comes. So the Lord is coming and he comes amongst us. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's judgment day. That's the coming of the Lord. There's another dimension of that too. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And some of the early fathers of the church, as I recall now, would speak about how on that day, our sins will be revealed to all. So that's an incentive to shape up, you know. This is maybe not the best motivation for, for, for doing these things. But our, our main hope is to, to run towards the Lord, to be with him. So let's just celebrate that and reflect upon the glory of the Lord, which should guide us like this Paschal candle. It guides us, it gives us a beacon in the midst of this world. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory.
it's always good every day to make an examination of conscience, and we should start it the way this starts. It's reflecting upon the life, the choice we need to make, and the glory of the Lord. And then we need to be ruthlessly honest for a period of time. Uh, too short a period and we become lax, too much and we become scrupulous. So a balanced period of time. But we have now to spend a brief period looking honestly at life on earth, the things of the earth that can drag us down. We've got to be familiar with them. There's an old book in the medieval spiritual English tradition called Handling Sin, a manual for handling sin. Well, we need to be not obsessed with that, but we need to be aware of it and uh, honest and open and not fools. Illusion is the great killer when we don't think we're just flipping along there, just going through life, just moving from day to day. So, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Whatever is earthly in you. But lest we wonder what that might be, because we can say, oh Lord, I am the greatest of sinners. Now let's move on to something else. Uh, let's, we don't sin in the abstract. We sin in the particular, just as we love God in the particular as well. So it's not enough to say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Now move on. No, no, we need to, let's get a little drill deeper, as they say. Um, let's unpack this a bit, because we need to look honestly at the different dimensions, the, the, the territory, the geography of our souls, the little pathways that lead us to the things of earth and away from the things that are above. We've got to be coldly aware and accurate of the fault lines within us, of the cracks within the diamond that comes from God that is our very self. We need to be aware of those things that the Lord allows us to experience that we might be humbled and tested and therefore invited to repentance and invited to greater compassion for everyone else who's also dealing with these things. So here we go. Fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It's interesting, the first few we, we certainly recognize, and these are part of the human condition that we, in our fallen state, we struggle with these realities the reality of human sexuality that is torn aside where love is turned into lust. The most profound uh, human statement of that perhaps is found in Sonnet 129 of, of Shakespeare. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And then he goes through the whole sorry reality. So attentive to what is real but also covetousness. And this is interesting, which is idolatry. When we're always looking out for number one, trying to pile up all kinds of stuff, it's idolatry. We don't often think of that way. To be greedy means to be worshiping idols. But yeah, we're worshiping money. We're worshiping our own comfort. We're making our own little security our God. We're clinging, and that's to very profoundly the opposite of where we're supposed to go. Remember, our Lord himself did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself. It's in that freeing path forward that we are given new life. And you know, these are all linked together. If you ever think of this, like fornication and covetousness, seem to be totally different worlds there. But not really. They're all that ego taking over, self-indulgence, grabbing, clinging, dominating. That is something which destroys us. And although the different weeds, you could say, at the top of the surface are all very different in outward appearance, their roots all tend to mingle under the soil. And therefore, there's a good thing about that if we think of the strategy for um, asking the Lord to help us, when 
we're caught up in one sin, it's often good to live another virtue, even if it doesn't seem connected to it. And that'll help free us from the grip because these things are all connected together. And if we can begin to break away from any of them, we will be helped to break away from all of them. And so he says, put to death therefore what, un- what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Let's ask the Lord's mercy for the ways in which these weeds have settled into our souls. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them. But now, put them all away. We once walked in them. And this is the ancient Hebrew way of speaking of life. We still use the term probably not thinking of ancient Hebrew thoughts, but walking the talk, the way we walk, the way our behavior, this matters. It's not enough to just praise the Lord, how we walk, how we, the path we walk on, the way to life or the way to death, the two ways, this matters. And so we hear in these, on account of them, the wrath of God is coming. This is not that God is angry in the sense of losing his temper the way we do, and which will be referred to a bit later, but the justice of God, the judgment of God. It's not the heart of our faith, but it's part of our faith. The sheep and also the goats, there we are. That's why it's good to go all the way through the divine comedy, inferno, hell, purgatory, and on to paradise. The goal is paradise, that's the point. But we gotta recognize the other pathway, and recognize the issue of judgment, the wrath of God. And we need just be attentive to that. And that's why in the, you know, the um, act of contrition, oh my God, I'm hardly sorry for having offended thee and I detest all of my sins because of thy just punishment. That's this part. But most of all, because thee offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love, That's the main reason we do not go the dark path the way downward. But the other part is in there. That's, uh, and that's what imperfect contrition is. You know, where we turn away from sin simply for fear of punishment. That's not enough really, but it's a start. Well, heaven knows the, the prodigal son was brought back to the father through hunger. A little, not the most noble of motivations, but uh, the Lord can work with anything. And so the wrath of God is there, but the key thing is what we hear later in this passage with the love of our Lord. But in these you once walked when you lived in them. So we lived in them. These things were part of our whole life. We walked in them because we lived in them. Just as St. John is always talking about how the Lord abides in us and we abide in him. How we, if we live in that world, of the things of the earth, it will show visibly by our walking in those things. But that walking in those things comes from living in them. It's the twigs and the branches and then there are the roots. That's why in our confession, when we go to confession, it's good to to note the twigs and the branches, the external facts, because we live that way. So many times I did this or that or the other. But then it's always helpful for our spiritual benefit since God doesn't need it, we do when we confess our sins, to then say, you know, I was uh, sarcastic 10 or 20 times this week or 10 or 11, whatever. And that's because, then we go down, that's the walking part. Because I am envious of the other person. That's why I was so harsh in my words. I was living in that. And that's what led to these evidences of it in my, the way I walk, of my behavior. So the two are always important in our confession to, to have those two things together. 
the nitty gritty part that's visible, that's the actual walking part, the behavior part, and then the living in part that gives the roots or the, the source. We need to know both. God already knows both, obviously. We're not informing God of something when we confess our sins. But we need that. We need it. In these you once walked when you lived in them. That's hopeful, isn't it? You once walked because we are now in Christ. But now put them all away. Away with all of that. And then he gives another list, which is very helpful. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and the foul talk from your mouth. Anger, wrath, so much in life is caught up in anger and wrath. Not righteous anger, which is in a sense of virtue, where we are righteously seeking to bring justice to the world. That is a good thing. If we see someone being beaten up and we simply say, oh, that's nice, there's a problem there if we're not angry at that. So certainly there's that form of anger which is righteous and is justice, the search for justice. But anger here, of course, is what we mean by this, where we stew over it anger, wrath, malice, where it gets to the heart of us. And you know how often anger is a pool that's fed from one stream and it comes out another? You know, where something is just irritating. Usually it's our own ego that's being bruised. And we get angry. The next person we see, we yell at them. What did I do? Well, you just happened to walk through the door. That was your problem. You know? how we can, when we get steaming about something, that's the part, the corrosive part of anger. We st stew in it, and it gets a grip on us, and we can't, it can, we can just get so caught up in that, and then it just sours life, and sometimes we're angry at another person who has done something wrong, and we can prove it was wrong, probably correctly. Probably the person's forgotten all about it, but we're stewing on it 20 years later. <laughs> well, what's the point, <laughs> you know? Oh dear, it just, life is short. We just, apart from the fact that we're not doing the other, we're not solving the problem by, and we're, we're also, uh, you know, hurting other people probably by yelling at them when, when they don't, they didn't do anything wrong because the anger that we got from one source is coming out of another. It's just wrecking our life. Like life is short. We do not have time for this. So we just say away. That's why the Lord said, you know, do not let the sun set on your anger. <laughs> let it go. It's just not worth it. And it's obviously just inward turning. Then it becomes slander. And there's a rare manuscript of Colossians that says, pause before you hit the send button. Anger and slander. And furthermore, did you hear that... Reply to all. <laughs> ah. the, the modern technology, I'm on, the, I'm on this uh, commission for social communications and, you know, we can get a little too much. And social communications, one of the great <laughs> realities, it allows us to slander more widely. Let our anger have greater negative effects. And, you know, if we're angry with somebody and we see them, we, we may be able to once more be at peace with them. But if we don't see them, we're just banging away on a keyboard. We can let it go and it can just go so much. It's not, we can be more harsh digitally than we are face to face. That's one reason why we should always deal with things face to face. It's the whole principle of subsidiarity in social justice teaching that decisions should be made by the people who see the face of those affected by the decisions. Not way, way far away where a little digital decision can wreck, whatever. So same two here. Slander and foul talk from your mouth. You know, this is St. James is a beautiful section on this. You know, the tongue can do beautiful things, like the, but it can, it's like a flame that can burn the forest down. 
really, we can use the tongue to praise God as we did during evening prayer. And then, you know, two seconds later, walk out and say, did you hear about, or just, ah, away with it all. Then, very important, words are important. We speak the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the word. He is the word. Language, in our own ordinary sense, is important. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature in its practices and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So don't lie to one another. Just honestly be with one another and speak the truth. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And we do deceive for so many reasons. Now, sometimes it, there is confidentiality and things like that, which are legitimate secrecy and things of that nature. In fact, that is very important. But we're talking here about lying, about distorting reality, because when we no longer have trust, what do we do? It's hard to live without trust. We trust one another's word. In fact, some of the great I remember hearing of one business, uh, wealthy business people who never would sign a contract. They just would give their word. And everyone knew their word was their bond. They would, you know, do multi-million dollar deals on their word. And people trusted their word from experience. So our word should be something that is trusted. There's a great line in the scripture. He keeps his word, come what may even though the situation changes and I, keeping my word might not be advantageous anymore. If I say I will do it, I want that to be truthful, not a lie. I will do it. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, We are to live in the imitation of Christ. And one of the best books ever written is The Imitation of Christ. I try every morning to read a little section. I've got, uh, I'm kind of digitally up to date here now, but I've got my little Kindle thing. I've got my my today section. And one is a little section of The Imitation of Christ. It's really sharp. And it says things like this. This Ronald Knox, who has the best translation, you know, he says that if anyone says you, he, he enjoys the imitation of Christ, he's either a dabbler or a saint. So, but it's this kind of, you know, you need a little shaken up. And that's what, of course, we have right here. So let's just ask the Lord to help us to live lives with simple integrity, without all these other things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Lord, help us to be that way. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. He is our Lord, and that makes everything flow from that, he who is above. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. These are the virtues we're called to live. This is the way that is above, not the way that is below. And it is, however, a pathway that's not a sort of an illusion, like a happy, happy land, because it deals with real problems, like the need to be patient with other people who also have the task of being patient with each one of us. So put these on and notice these virtues are gentle virtues. They are daily, nitty gritty 
life in this world virtues. Holy and beloved, compassion, to be able to suffer with, calm passion, suffer with another person. We should learn this more and more as the years go by, especially as we keep saying, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, and then are honest about it as in the early section here, to then be able to suffer with others, share with them their own struggles. You know, to walk a mile in their moccasins, that idea. To compassion, not to be isolated in our own little palace of virtue, but understanding our own frailty and sinfulness. Let us therefore have compassion, reach out. It's not sympathy, which is sort of just a, not just a kind of a vague feeling of niceness towards people, but it's really to be attentive to the situation of another person, to live their life. And in a sense, I often think of this in the, the Psalms, that in praying the divine office, for example, as we just did before earlier this evening, as we pray the Psalms, we are living the life of different people. Every, the Psalms have everything in them, hatred, vileness, evil, goodness, joy, sorrow, anxiety, everything. And so one of the ways to pray the Psalms, especially if we're praying the divine office, is to role play them. Like when we're praying a psalm of sadness, pray be, be sad, a joy, be joy. Not what I feel like at the moment, but the way the other person is. This is why if, when, if we're required by our commitment in life to pray the divine office every day, to pray the psalms every day, and in my own life that has been since May 14, 1972, when I made that commitment as a deacon, as we do it, we sometimes think as we're praying the psalms that are kind of in tune with what we're, where I'm at, I'm kind of happy about that. And I, I skip through the ones that, you know, it's the basic rule of the liturgy is eat what's on your plate. You know, say the black, do the red, things like that. So this is good because it, it takes ego and just squishes it away, just away with that. So, but we turn the page and here's a psalm of joy. And I'm feeling rather miserable today. How dare they have a psalm of joy? Hmm. Well, I should then be joyful. Okay, I'll be joyful. At least for the, and then I think of the people who are living a different life. I don't have the only experience in life. Other people are joyful. Let's get out of my own little world. And then I turn the next page and it's sorrow. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'm feeling rather happy. I don't feel it, but there are other people who are feeling that. They're living that. I may not be, but they are. So let's get into their life. And that is compassion. That is suffering with. Role-playing ourselves into the lives of others. And ultimately, this is what Christ our Lord, he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to enter into this world, even to death on the cross. That's the way. He shows it to us. And so he's, we hear that beloved compassion. And if we are compassionate, and not just in our own little way, then kindness. Like, just be kind to people. You know, even if we're, you know, this is where anger we can get. Let's just be kind to people. That's such a little thing, you might say. It's not like martyrdom or whatever. It's be kind. Say thank you to people. It's important. And we appreciate it when someone's kind, don't we? When someone goes out of their way to be kind. And we don't appreciate it when someone is harsh or treats us like a thing. Lowliness, meekness, and patience. Well, patience. Forbearing one another. He goes a long way into patience. For because we need it. Forbearing one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Yep, there we are. Patience. I should do that little thing that I remember when I was growing up as a, as a kid. This is not very kind to men, but it says, patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. It's seldom found in women and never found in men. But I don't know whether that's fair or not, but anyway, I remember that's what I was taught when I was a little kid. And above all, 
So we're looking at these. This is, he's getting into the nitty gritty of stuff. But then he says, above all, put on love. And the love here is not friendship love. It is not the physical love and the sexual love. It's the love of strangers. Agape It's the love of strangers. That's the most important love. The love, the generous love of others. And above all, put on love, which binds these together in perfect harmony. Just as St. Francis de Sales said about the devout life, that, about holiness and all that, it's like a beautiful honey that you pour over different jewels to make them all shine more brightly. Well, whatever we do, if we do it with compassion and love, then it will be drawn together. That's the key. The greatest of these is love. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Oh, yes. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. It's the peace of Christ. When we have surrendered to the Lord and we have put to death, say, Lord, take away these things of my own ego, then the peace of Christ will rule in our hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It all comes to Christ, not just his message, but who he is. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. No music in hell, but in Dante's profound, the greatest of poems, once you get to purgatory, people start singing. They're singing their way up the Mount of Purgatory because it is, we join together when we sing. You know, Augustine says, the one who sings prays twice. There's harmony and God is harmony. There is order and harmony, not discord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In Christ, we do everything in Christ. Whatever we do, if I can say, am I doing this in Christ? That's the simple heart of it all. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>